Hello. Yes? What? No, thanks very much. It's awfully good of you, but I'm much too busy today. Yes, yes, very, very busy. Yes. Hello, and welcome to Edinburgh Travel Maniac. This is my new channel. In this video series, I will explore some of Edinburgh's landmarks, stories, restaurants, iconic pubs and shops, including some must-see locations and sites inside and out. This is David, your host, and today you will learn about the story of Scotland's most loyal dog, Greyfriars Bobby. For those who have not heard about Bobby, the story in a nutshell goes as the following. This Sky Terrier has guarded his owner's grave from the 15th of February 1858 for 14 straight years, day and night, against the challenging weather conditions of 18th century Edinburgh. Well, the tale of Bobby has multiple versions, of course. As the years went by, the well-educated American lady Eleanor Atkinson popularized it in her novel Walt Disney used this writing as the basis of the 1961 movie Greyfriars Bobby, the true story of a dog. As I said, the story by today had the skeptics research further and it was revealed that the true story might not be as we thought. Let me guide you through the stories and possibilities that surround Scotland's most loved pooch. Pooch is actually the word in Scottish for dog. Welcome to the actual true story of Greyfriars Bobby. Okay, so we are in Edinburgh, the capital of Scotland. This is where the story of Bobby takes place. On this rather sunny day, I decided to take a walk around the memorial of Greyfriars Bobby and the Greyfriars Kirkyard, where Bobby is buried. Just to start with, I will introduce you the most commonly known version. This is the one I knew prior to this research, and I believe this is the one that most of the people accept. This article was written by Ben Johnson and was published on historicuk.com. So this is how the article reads. In 1850, a gardener called John Gray, together with his wife Jess and son John, arrived in Edinburgh. Unable to find work as a gardener, he avoided the workhouse by joining the Edinburgh police force as a night watchman. To keep him company through the long winter nights, John took on a partner, a Sky Terrier, his watchdog called Bobby. Together, John and Bobby became a familiar sight trudging through the old cobble streets of Edinburgh. The years on the streets appeared to have taken their toll on John as he was treated by the police surgeon for tuberculosis. John eventually died of the disease on the 15th of February 1858 and was buried in Greyfriars Kirkyard. Bobby soon touched the hearts of the local residents when he refused to leave his master's grave, even in the worst weather conditions. Article ends. This version sounds relatively easy to digest and I can understand why the author probably felt to leave out John Trail and his coffee house. So John Trail and his, his coffee house was where Bobby and John Gray or Old Jock used to pay a visit. This is actually where the story starts to mismatch with some actual facts and start raising a few questions. According to the movie by Walt Disney, Greyfriars Bobby, the true story of a dog, John Gray, old jog, has visited John Trail's pub. As the movie goes, once John Gray passed away, it was John Trail who fed Bobby and later protected him. This was due to the introduction of the 1867 Dog Duty Act, which meant that dogs without owners would be put off. So this is the story that sort of surrounds the Walt Disney movie that I would recommend you to, to go and watch. It is actually available on YouTube 
for free to watch i found it and the link is in the description if you feel like just giving it a go it's, it's kind of a fun and happy story of grave eyes bobby i was enjoying going through some of its scenes while i was doing some research for this video thanks to the city and actually a countrywide known phenomenon that this small dog is guarding his master's grave sir william chambers who was the lord provost or the lord mayor of edinburgh has licensed bobby in 1867 so this was due to avoid killing off bobby he paid the fees that come with owning a dog gave bobby his collar that is today displayed in the museum of edinburgh along with bobby's drinking cup and bowl so this footage that you see here is actually from the museum of edinburgh that is located on the cannon gate just off the historic royal mile which is Edinburgh's 900 year old high street. I can easily recommend you to pay a visit to this establishment. The entry is free and all you have to do is just show up and explore the place. The museum is hosted in a 16th century tenement home. It is very worth it. Okay, let's go back to the pub, right? To John Trail's place, figuratively speaking, haha. <laughs> Other later versions of the story indicate that John Gray couldn't visit John Trail's coffee house, as John Trail did not own the place until four years later of John Gray's death. In a newspaper article in The Scotsman, Gray Pies Bobby A Dog's Devotion, published on the 11th of August 1934, Councillor Wilson McLaren states that he had spoken with Mr. Trail, the owner of the coffee house, in 1871 about John Gray the farmer and reassured the readers of the magazine about the story that Mr. Trail had given him about knowing John Gray and Bobby. Once this was published, right, so the story has attracted the attention of many other authors. The Scottish writer and historian, the late Forbes MacGregor, who published Greyfriars Bobby, The Real Story at Last, due to his detective work in Edinburgh's archives, revealed that Bobby's owner was definitely one, John Gray started out as a farmer, as a shepherd in the Pentland Hills, and he later became the watchman when he befriended Bobby. There is another commonly brought up controversy which actually most of the stories include and that's around Edinburgh's one o'clock gun and its relation to Bobby. According to the tales, Bobby used to show up at the coffee house at one o'clock for his dinner. And for those who do not know what the story of the one o'clock gun is, here's a quick summary. Up to this day, by the way, Edinburgh shoots a blank cannon at exactly 1 p.m. since 1867. This was started to tell the time to the people of Edinburgh. So every day at 1 p.m. the cannon is fired and people are supposed to know that it is now exactly 1 p.m. I have this video to show. I was taking a little break during work the other day. Luckily, I was just nearby Castle Street where I had a remarkable view over Edinburgh Castle. And this was all just before 1 p.m. making it easy for me to capture the cannon being fired. So here you can see the silhouette of Edinburgh Castle as this thousand year old fortress sits on Castle Hill. People who timed their castle visit well can see from an exclusive distance. So people who go to Edinburgh Castle, which I would much recommend to see, can actually plan their visit just before 1 p.m. That would give them this extra exclusive feature of seeing Edinburgh's one o'clock gun being fired. All right, I hope you're ready. I will come back from five, four, three, two. Okay. According to Legend of Bobby, let's go back to that. His dinner was timed at the restaurant to 1 p.m. since John Gray took his lunch at that time of the day. This would explain why Bobby kept going back to the coffee house 
and befriended the owner of the coffee house, John Trail. However, this is actually not quite true. The cannon shot was not introduced until 1861 and John Gray have passed away in 1858. Some of the more accurately researched versions of the story would not state that John Gray had visited the place during the day. It does actually say that he finished his night shift as a policeman and just after that he went to grab his supper. The 23 <laughs> Some of the biggest questions around the topic are still not answered. We have cleared out that there was only one John Gray, who was a shepherd and later a policeman, who had a watchdog named Bobby. There was John Trail's temperance coffee house that he started to own four years after John Gray died, and a dog named Bobby showed up there at 1 p.m. John Trail also spoke about John Gray, so he might have known him from somewhere, even before him starting to own the place where John Gray actually did go for his dinner after his shift. So he might know Bobby, but he did not own the place, it looks like, while John Gray was visiting. So that's a possibility again, that Bobby might got used to the friendly atmosphere of the location, and he might uh, actually wander back occasionally. But this doesn't make too much sense. Unless we take into consideration this other theory that I have found on mustseescotland.com that there was a certain gentleman called Surgeon Scott who heard the story of this loyal animal and befriended Bobby, becoming sort of his second guardian. Surgeon Scott decided to teach the dog to show up at the coffee house exactly at 1pm. So this makes a little bit more sense to me. So let's just see a quote from the website. McGregor suggests that this terrier's loyalty did not necessarily involve sleeping out in all weathers. During Forbes McGregor's research in the city archives, by sheer good luck, the author found a kind of witness statement to the effect that the occupants of the houses in Kedlamaker Row, adjacent to Grey Friars, usually looked out for Bobby and gave the V-Dog food and shelter. For sure Bobby frequented the kirkyard, it seems, but was not averse to offers of a warm bed sometimes. Yep, certainly sounds like a dog. So this is the moment when we are unpacking the truth, so listen up. According to Jan Bonnesson, a Swedish-British rheumatologist who worked as a scientist, author, senior lecturer and consultant rheumatologist at the Cardiff University School of Medicine, has done research on non-fictional topics such as medical anomalies and unsolved murders. In one of his writings, he advances that fundamental facts about the dog and its loyalty are probably wrong. In 19th century Europe, there are over 60 documented accounts of graveyard or cemetery dogs. They were stray dogs, fed by visitors and curators to the point that the dogs made the graveyards their home. People began to believe that they were waiting by a grave and so the dog has looked after. Bonnison claims after an article about Bobby appeared in The Scotsman, visitor numbers to the graveyard increased, which supposedly created a commercial benefit for the local community. Bonnison also speculates that in 1867, the original Bobby died and was replaced with a younger dog, which explains Bobby's supposed longevity, which is five years less than the years we commonly believe today about Bobby's death. Well, this sounds somewhat more believable, however, this is still not convincing enough for me to completely alter the original story, as it is written all across town and this is what most of us believe. So this led me to dig up one of the books that I bought two years ago to prepare to be a guide in the city back in the day. In this book, only in Edinburgh, 
written by Duncan J. D. Smith, a guide to unique locations, hidden corners, and unusual objects, I have found the paragraph that states that the story of Grave Eyes Bobby is actually not completely true and corresponds with the theory and stories published by Jen Bonderson. However, since that very one day when I read the paragraph, I was unable to find it once again for years and I got much confused about the story of Grave Eyes Bobby, leaving me in total confusion about the realism of the story. This book is phenomenal, by the way, as an Annie Brooke fanboy, I can read it for you as one of the best easy to read history and facts collections from recent times. You can grab it from Amazon, so please go ahead if you're interested. Anyways, the author of this book says that in 2011, a new research revealed that the story was a hoax created to attract visitors to the cemetery and to the nearby restaurant. The real Bobby was a stray mongrel that was encouraged to stay put by being fed scraps. When it died in 1867, a second dog, and this time a Sky Terrier, was brought in to ensure that the story kept the businesses healthy. This matches with Bonson's statement that there must have been two dogs also explains how John Gray could still own a dog and occasionally visit the coffee house in question. As far as why Sir William Chambers, the Lord Provost, has licensed Bobby, the article on mossyscotland.com raises the question very right, in my opinion just as well. Did the Lord Provost license Bobby for PR? And on my opinion this is probably true, this, is, this makes a lot of sense. Licensing a dog which was made famous by its story and made money to the city's most important kirkyard, the Greyfires Kirkyard, where the National Covenant was signed and Mir of Scots established the graveyard as a burial ground in 1562, after the one by the St. Giles Cathedral became overcrowded. Furthermore, the story brought business to John Trill's coffee house, plus the local amenities have benefited from it. You can see how this all comes together, and obviously, why wouldn't you license a lovely dog that is loved by everyone? Up to this day, this is one of the most loved stories of Edinburgh and its visitors. We can thank the smart marketing brains of the 18th century. Numerous authors and even Walt Disney have published media around this topic. Bobby actually brings very large amounts of visitors to Edinburgh and warms many child's hearts. The legend of Griffiths Bobby will always stay close to even my heart. Now that the story is officially debunked, I think this makes it even more interesting and fascinating comparing it to the original version as we thought for many years. I will link in the description the full 1961 Walt Disney movie as it is available on YouTube for free. Thanks very much for watching. Please, if you like this video and if you would like to receive more videos like this, don't forget to subscribe. Press the like button because that would get some attention to this video. You can even share it if you fancy it. Please stay tuned for the next video when I discuss the nation's favorite topic, which is 